The theme of marriage is very prominent in the book of Revelation. The reason being is not just because the saints will marry Christ, as is commonly supposed, but there are other themes going on simultaneously. When you have time as a student to study the term virgin is what I would recommend. What was a virgin in the ancient world? Well, we know that she was a woman who obviously hadn't been married, but she also prepared the way for the bride, writes Montgomery. And so that is why Matthew 25 is so pertinent to our understanding about this subject and why virgins were so important. They also sang in the choir as, of course, the bride meant the bridegroom. We see that in the book of Revelation as well, where there are two witnesses who are also witnessing the event of the coming together of the bride and the bridegroom on the sea of glass. What else happens? They were not to slumber or to be late for the wedding invitation. They were to make the way for the guests, which were written in the little book of Revelation chapter 10. In this particular section of scripture, we call this a hinge because it actually ties the scenes of God together from one set of dramatic action to another. Said John in chapter 10, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped with a cloud with a rainbow over his head, whose face was that like the sun, and the legs like pillars, and a little scroll opened in his hand. And he sat at the right foot of the sea. And we already commented earlier what that sea meant in Canaanite mythology. And called out like a loud voice, like a lion, because that's what the Lord will return as. And the seven thunders sounded when I was about to write, I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the seven thunders and do not write it down. For the angel whom I saw standing on the sea lifted up his right hand, and that's the seat of authority, to heaven and swore by him who lives forever, who created heaven and what is in it, and the earth and what is in it, and the sea, and what is in it. That there should be no more delay, quoting from Amos there. And in the days the trumpet shall be sounded by the seventh angel, and the mystery of God, as he announced to his servants, the prophets, should be fulfilled. And then, of course, the eating of the scroll takes place to digest its contents in the rest of that section of Scripture. Notice once again, the angel is told to hold back the meaning of the book because the bride hadn't made herself ready yet. Number one. Number two. Seal up the seven thunders is just a way of saying don't open that part of the document, writes Draper, whose PhD is in the seven seals, because they went through various stages to prepare 
the documents to be opened by a person of royalty within the palace. And then it talks about there shall be no more delay. In other words, the judgment is imminent. So when the bride is called forth, she is seen as having been judged and been a real virgin of virgins. So we need to get the cultural understanding of what is being talked about here. There shall be no more delay. How many times has God put off sending his Messiah to establish the new world to fulfill the predictions of his prophets? But God's people haven't been ready. So finally, God has to do one of two things. Get us ready by any means possible or by abandoning his promises. And that he has told us he would never do. But the delayed parousia or the appearing of the bridegroom as he waits and waits for his bride to make herself ready. Either that or the world goes into a judgment motif. Writes Roland from a Roman Catholic perspective. Because of the fact these prophecies can be seen as conditional. Conditioned upon what? The bride making herself ready. If we go back and pick the particular narrative up in Luke's gospel. Where it says the Lord cannot return until the bride has made herself ready. Well, we don't know how to make ourselves ready. Because we don't know what a Jewish bride did to complete this process. So what you had was garments prepared, the little book, guest book prepared. You had a meal prepared. You had the talismans, you know, of virginity prepared uh, to show the entire community that she truly was a virgin when the party arrived outside the father's house. You had a dowry, that was the bridal price that Christ paid for the church. See, and all this culminates in the second coming, where we are prepared to go to our home in Zion, or Zion. So, all of this wedding imagery was taken very seriously. There's also the preparation for the crown. A diadem or a stephanos. The royal diadem was that of a king. A stephanos was that of a Olympic runner from the ancient games from the Olympiad. So on the one hand, you have the Apostle Paul stating, well, we run a race. And he uses over 300 illustrations of running the Olympiad. You know, like you jump on a pole vote for the prize of the high calling after you clear the goal. And if you don't, it's harmatea. It's a sin to miss the mark you see. And so all these marvelous illustrations add a great deal to our understanding. Now, back to the bride. So what we have, there was a sonnet, a ring made ready. Those have been found, according to Biblical Archaeology Review, that showed eternal love. 
There were crowns that in ancient Judah, these crowns were worn by the husband and the bride-to-be. It showed eternal love and rulership when the world would be coronated in God's image in yet a future time. It also showed the eternal love and bond that would outlast the marriage state. You can go into St. Vladimir's Quarterlies and check out the meaning of Matthew 22, 30 from an orthodox perspective where the couple would share love seats in the world to come, writes Stephanic, and they would share in these love seats in an eternal perspective by sharing a crown, by sharing rulership, because they would fulfill being heirs in the grace of life to come, wrote Peter. And so inheritance is also eternal love, as it is shared by God's saints throughout the ages upon the ages. But our bride would wear a crown just like the bridegroom would give to the rest of the saints. These would be part of the reward celebration in the ancient coronation practices in preparing us for kingship, just like the dedication of the temple happened in Second Chronicles chapter 34 through 36, where a coronation would befit a king, where they would receive a crown and a garment. They'd go through a death, burial, and resurrection mocked celebration. They would be anointed from head to toe. These things were a part of the ancient wedding ceremony of our ancestors. My PhD dissertation from sacral kingship to sacred marriage deals with this theme, as does the book of Revelation, but it's something that has been virtually dropped from our church understanding, with the exception of the Far Eastern churches, the Orthodox, and some Latter-day Saint scholars who apply it to their temple endowments. Other than that, it is virtually not talked about. It also fulfills the Book of Psalms, or Temple Hymnody. Scholars such as Weezer, and, of course, many other reform scholars have picked this enthronement theme up from Psalms. Samuel Bacchioki picked it up to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Shelters. As we move down this path or hadas or road and the palm branches are laid at our feet just like they were on Palm Sunday, when we would trim back the palms to actually trim back the Gentile powers, so the powers of the Messiah and the bridal train to follow, called the firstborn, the prototokeus of many brethren, to follow the bride to Zion, which we would go up the hill by Revelation 14, verse 3, and occupy and await to have the Lord's Supper. Then we would have ultimate oneness with God when the final enthronement, the final embrace would take place that would give us final reconciliation. And all of these enthronement rites, number 22 in totality, 
Wow, the ancient Egyptian kings looked for these. Ancient Babylonian, ancient Canaanite, ancient Jewish kings would celebrate these during the Feast of Tabernacles, during the last great day, when they thought even Yahweh would come back and be enthroned and rise Israel over the Gentile Goyim and actually give Israel her rightful place when she would be high above other nations, wrote the prophets. 